Hey everyone, welcome to The Grey Escape. I'm Natalie Grey and I'll be back right after this. I've heard it said that sound is 60% of the movie experience. If sound is 60%, what does that make the voice? When it comes to animation where the voice captures the lion's share of the character's nuances and subtle emotions, I'm guessing that 60% gets bumped up a notch. Because it's only through the truth of the actor voicing an animated character that we are able to be lost in the story and in the moment. It is as the real emotion resonates through the honed craftsmanship of the voiceover artist that we believe the circumstances and suspend our disbelief. Suspension of disbelief. The term coined in 1817, according to Wikipedia, by poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge, who suggested that if a writer could infuse a human interest and a semblance of truth into his fantastical tale, the reader, or of course now the viewer, would suspend judgment about the implausibility of the story. It is suspension of disbelief that enabled us all to cry in Bambi as we watched a series of cellulose sheets hand-painted with images depicting the demise of a wounded doe, a cartoon. But we cried, most of us. When Ross kissed Rachel on Friends, we swooned even though we know they're actors. We suspended our disbelief to feel and believe that they finally hooked up. When we call our cell phone provider and get the automated customer service, we suspend our disbelief that they're actually trying to help us and not trying to drive us to a nervous breakdown. Today, we'll meet with a man who is truly skilled in the art of voiceover. He's played every kind of character and beast you could imagine. In fact, you can see him right now, or should I say hear him right now, creating the compelling life of Gorilla Grodd in the CW television series The Flash. David Soboloff is one of the top voiceover actors in the industry. He's also directed and produced his own film projects, and he is an avid collector of vintage packaging. How unusual. I was very honoured to be invited into his home for this interview, and a big heads up. During the interview, there are some interruptions, courtesy of a plumbing incident. And I decided, you know what, rather than try to artificially splice out these interruptions, I thought, let's keep it real. However, the plumber did not actually speak. So, in tribute to the spirit of voiceover of this episode, I will be playing the voice of the plumber. Let us go bravely forward into the abode of voiceover heavy hitter David Soboloff. I've never spent a lot of money for an air conditioner before in my life, and I did on that, and boy, am I glad I did. It's great. I like how your air conditioner looks like a Coca-Cola vending machine. Oh, that's good. We could start with that even. Nice, yeah. It kind of fits in with all it's the stuff. It's so appropriate, yeah. <laughs> I mean... Uh, yeah, but I mean, do people really care about my stuff? I think that it's very novel and interesting. So how would you describe we're in your apartment... And we're surrounded by what appears to be a historical collection of packaging. Well, it all started with my mother and her picture is over there on the wall. Yeah. She was a swing singer in the 1940s. And as a very young kid, that got me interested in the era. I started collecting all these old packages when I was 10 years old. So everything you see around here is now 40, some, some wow. of it is 40 years old. Wow. Well, plus the age it is. On the wall over there, I have a fan letter that was sent to my mother in 1942. And oh. I also have her contract, which is really interesting to look at because back then, um, you know, I know that women are still exploited. Women are still demeaned in show business. Boy, they sure were behind the scenes back then. Oh, you know, I can the imagine. contract basically says she has to make friends of important people, do what the band leader tells her, yet don't date anyone in the band. And 
I don't know if we're rolling yet. Is this part yeah, of the... yeah, we are. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the contract that my mother signed, it actually says that if he decides to fire her, he becomes her agent for five years. Good grief. Just the crazy stuff that she had to deal with back then. And what exactly does it mean you have to make friends with important people? I mean, is Who it knows? just that yeah. or... It's left open. You're supposed to date people and... I'll never know. She died when I was 17. Oh. So we didn't get to talk about this stuff much. She told me a little bit, but I found these things when she died. She hid them. It's like she, uh, she, she wasn't very prideful. You know, she wasn't bragging about the, the things she had done. For her, her, um, her accomplishments were her children, I think, at a certain point. And how many of you are there? I have two older sisters. Okay, okay. Was there a big gap? Uh, a very scientific gap. My father was a chemist, oh. and they had us four years apart exactly so they could afford to send us to university. Oh, my goodness. Wow. I've never heard of planning like this before with children. <laughs> Especially back then. <laughs> yeah. Well, this packaging, I mean, you started when you were 10. Where do you even find this now? Like well, I'm looking at Nestle Quick. I mean, what year is the Nestle Quick from? Do you know I think that's 1957, the, the first wow. year that it existed. I have a Pop-Tarts here from 1964. I always like getting things from the first year that they happened. Wow. Uh, I've got uh, a Tide detergent box behind us here from, I believe, 1952. A lot of it comes from eBay. Um, uh, people start giving me things, too, because they know I collect this. Very few people collect this stuff. It's like a mini hoarding if you were in the 50s. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope it's displayed and not Yeah, in no, piles. it looks fantastic. Yeah. And so why did you, what's the thing with the packaging? Why did you want to do this? What's the it's, draw? It's pop culture. It kind of, it, it captures the essence of an era, or at least how it was presented to the public, mm. which I find kind of interesting. I've got a Kentucky Fried Chicken bucket from the 1960s. Wow. And you can't see from here, but if I turned it around, it's all in French as well. And that's also a memory for me growing up in Canada. The bucket had French and English on it. Right. I'm kind of rebuying my childhood and, in a sense, the childhood of my mom, too. So you grew up in Windsor, Ontario, though, yeah. which I've been to. And that's not a very French town, is it, Windsor? You'd be surprised how French it is. Really? Uh, almost all the streets have French names. Okay. There are French high schools. There's a, a town outside huh. of Windsor that's all French. Uh, okay. It was originally part of France. Detroit was Detroit. Oh. It was France. Oh. Many hundreds of years wow. ago. Wow. I wonder how many people know that. Well, now they do. <laughs> now, hopefully, millions of people know it because yeah. they're talking to you. They're hearing us. I like your confidence in the podcast. <laughs> millions of people. <laughs> well, you have millions of people hear you. That's that's for sure. I mean, your IMDB is, it's like reading the Declaration of Independence. It goes on and on and, you know, with these there's the games, there's movies, the TV shows. So how did this all come to be? Let's let's start from the beginning. You're this kid collecting packaging, and I, then what? I was a French horn player back then. Oh, as you are? <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore, but I was. Um, the last time I played my horn was for a pit orchestra job for West Side Story okay. in 1995. I tend to do things all the way or nothing at all, and it was the end of an era for me. I was starting to do animation. And I put my horn away after the show ended, and I never picked it up again. I may again someday, but it was just time to move on to something else. And what year would this be? 1995. So 95 marked the end of the French horn yeah. era. And around that time, I was touring with an a cappella group singing. Wow. I spent a year doing that. I love a cappella groups. So you're a singer as well. I have been. I haven't done as much of it since I moved to Los Angeles 15 years ago. It was a big thing in the 90s for me. Were you the deep baritone? Is that what they call it? The bass. deepest voice? The deep bass. bass, yes. Wow. They're cool. I, I was never cool. I was always kind of nerdy, but I found the, the deep voice singer is the cool one in the group for some reason. People <laughs> like that. It seems the deep voice guys for some reason are always bald. Yeah, that, that's... I'm stereotyping th everything today. Yeah. Not good. <laughs> so, I mean, how do you even get into an a cappella group? I don't even remember how I did it, but I, I must have auditioned for it. It seemed like something interesting to do. And what did you guys do? I mean, did you actually earn your money this way? Live shows or? Live shows. Uh, we recorded, but uh, we toured mostly schools. Uh, around okay. that time in British Columbia, I was living in Vancouver. Okay. Uh, around that time, they were eliminating music programs in the schools. And they still had funding for them, but they didn't, they wanted to go to more core curriculum. I think music should be core curriculum, but at that time they were getting into other things. And we started touring these schools 
to give them music. Mm. And we taught, you know, there was teaching involved as well. And we went all over into really remote areas. I got to see things you would never see. I was flying in float planes, landing on water. Wow. When I got my first cartoon series, uh, regular role, it was a show called Vortech that was on Fox, but it was recorded in Vancouver. Uh, I was in the middle of a tour. I had to pay the salary of everyone in the group and hire a little plane to fly into the forest to pick me up wow. and take me back to Vancouver. Most beautiful flight I've ever had. We went in a beautiful, uh, clear day flying just the two of us in the middle of the mountains in the wilderness. And this is to record a voice for an animation? Yeah, it was a a show directed by Sue Blue, who later directed me in Beast Wars. And so, I mean, how did this all come about, though? So you're you're a musician playing the French horn and then you're singing. Uh, I mean, was it a conscious decision? Like, hey, I want to be a singer, or did some opportunity just cross your path and you were like, I'll give that a try? Well, I'm going to go back a little bit because it's an interesting story why I even got into music at all. It was really for my mom. Okay. Uh, My mother had a singing career uh, that she gave up and she married my dad. She met him. She had given up singing. She was working as a, uh, what do they call this? I think teletype operator, technology that doesn't exist anymore. In at a, high, a, a company called Hiram Walkers. Okay. And their liquor company. This was in Illinois. She met my dad. She moved to Canada. So she gave up her country. She gave up her career. She gave up her religion. She converted to be Jewish uh, from Lutheran to marry okay. my dad. Okay. And she became very lonely. And she wasn't having a great life. And I thought, I wanted to do something to make my mother happy. I'm a little kid. I'm in the sixth grade. And there an, aptitude, an aptitude test came up for music. And I took it and did well at it. And I thought, this is going to make her happy. Mm-hmm. And I really had, didn't really care about it at the time. I kind of grew into caring about it over the, over time. But it was great that I lived, she lived long enough uh, to see me do a lot with a French horn, to start to uh, do some professional work, even though I was very young. Uh, and I was in a, a group called the Scarlet Brigade. It was a marching band, okay. which is very rare in Canada. Okay. They actually don't have a lot of marching band in Canada, we were only about three of us. So we kept winning the Canadian champion championship, but there were only, you know, two other competitors. So <laughs> it wasn't a huge achievement, but it, it was a great um, character building thing for me. But it also made her happy. It got her out of the house. There was a booster club that she could be involved in. And when she died, I hope I don't get choked up when I'm saying this, there is a, a picture on the wall over there of me playing French horn when I was wow. 15. And that was right beside her when she died. Oh, so she knew I'd be getting to, into the arts, and I think she'd be very happy about the way my was uh, she very life, old where, where my life took me. Um, fifty six. Okay, so she had you a little bit later then. Yeah, she was for that 40. era. Yeah, that would have been older to have a child. But she always wanted to have a boy, and something I'll show you later. I have all of the uh, original uh, cards and things that she was given when I was born. And she always wanted a boy named David. And back then they couldn't test to see if it it was a boy or a girl. Mm. And dad wrote on this card, the odds have shortened. Mm. Because, you know, she had the boy. And, uh, yeah. Wow. So from the music, then the singing, where did the voiceover and the acting come from? I always wanted to act. I really didn't have an outlet for it in my town, Windsor, Ontario at the time. There wasn't a lot going on theatrically. Uh, so, you know, and I was into the music and I was happy and I went off from Windsor, Ontario to British Columbia to study music in university. Mm -hmm. And then I started getting into doing some stage work, some amateur stuff. And I really was enjoying it, doing some student films, enjoying that. I auditioned for the neighborhood playhouse school in New York and got in there. So I left my music school and went to New York to study with Sanford Meisner. And how old are you at this point? 19. 19, head into New York. That's exciting. Wow. It was a time when uh, it was very dangerous in New York, but very fun. You could be anything you wanted. Nobody cared. You could go out on the street and run your scenes, run your lines, do a crazy character mm. in front of people. Nobody cared. Wow. It was it was kind of chaos then. Where did you York. live? What area? Uh, I moved a lot. Uh, for a while, I lived at 82nd and 3rd. Okay. And it's I know still that there. Area. The building is still there. And Upper it's a East Side. Six floor walk up. Okay. And you're 19, you don't care. You know, I walked up six flights of stairs, I didn't care. My voice is very quiet today. I've been doing a lot of screaming lately, a lot of video game work. Oh. So I it's a little tired voice, today. I think it sounds, it sounds oh, good to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's legendary, studying with Sanford Meisner himself. What was it like studying with him? How would you encapsulate his Meisner technique that we hear bounced around so much? Well, it's Meisner, you know, it's Meisner. 
tell us what the Meisner technique really is. He had catchphrases that are actually very, very useful. He said, uh, you need to live truthfully under given imaginary circumstances. And you can't get much more imaginary than animation and video games. So that has served me very well over time. Uh, he also said uh, that acting is the reality of doing. Uh, we're trying to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes, but learning to do that and sound real is a huge amount of work. It's very hard for most people just to sound like we're talking right now, mm -hmm. but with somebody else's words and somebody else's body and yeah. somebody else's life. Uh, that's the challenge to make it sound like it's, it's happening the moment you open your mouth. And I try to approach my work in animation like that. And I think if I hadn't studied with Meisner, I wouldn't be sitting here today. And what sort of exercises, I mean, how does he teach you then to live truthfully in imaginary circumstances? What, did, what would be some of the exercises you would do in class to enable this? He starts by getting you out of your head. There's a repetition exercise, which mm -hmm. usually turns to anger. You're just repeating. It gets annoying to repeat what the other person is saying over and over and over again. And usually it devolves to swearing. You know, you're, you, you look at, you make an observation and say, right. um, there are glasses on your face. And then you'll say... There are glasses on my there face. Are glasses there are glasses on, my on your face. face. And you go back and forth. So you learn a few things with that. The text doesn't matter. All that matters is, well, it will eventually. But you know, that you, you really what matters really is the emotion underneath what you're saying uh, when you're first starting out. So you can learn to be free and open and, and just live in the moment and not have preconceived ideas about what the text is. Mm. I think a lot of people do that. Um, they'll come into an audition. That's how sometimes they blow their audition. They get really, really stuck on one way of doing things and the director can't get them out of it. And this technique helps you to just be malleable. A lot of this acting stuff, though, I mean, over the years, you know, I've done Meisner classes and stuff. And it's I find a lot of the time it's all very well and good in the classroom to be able to have that time to go. I've got glasses on my face. So yeah. And, you know, and spend five minutes saying this. But when you go to a set then, or in your case, you go to a, a audio recording studio and you don't, you can't just be saying your lines over and over again. So well, that's just the very, very beginning okay. exercise. Uh, then there's something called an emotional preparation where you have to come into the scene with a certain emotion. So you take something from your own life or something that, you know, affects you. Think about it for a moment, let that emotion kind of sit deeply and then jump into the scene and hopefully that emotion will be underneath mm. and you aren't forcing any emotion because you already, it's almost like fuel in your tank. Okay. Uh, that's that. And then there, there's something they do called an independent activity where you're actually doing something, the reality of doing. Meisner did not believe in miming anything. Mm. You always had to have the props mm -hmm. that you would have. I, I've done this when I've been, I've been teaching. It's interesting because I'm, I'm teaching voice acting, mm -hmm. uh, which to me is just acting, but there's some technical things that are a bit different, obviously, because you can't see the body. Right. You have to hear the room. You know, I'm in a sandstorm. You have to think that it's really yeah. a sandstorm happening. But if it was an on-camera or a, a stage technique class, somebody would be doing something, like even if it's something like knitting, while the lines are being said. All these exercises meant to take you out of your head, to right. take you out of, those, as I said, those preconceived notions of what a line is saying. Yeah. It could say, you know, if I'm saying, go to the store, what if I'm angry about that? What if I'm sad while that's happening? What if I if there's something at the store that is going to change my life, yeah, that changes the line. Right. And that's all based on all those other things, the pre-life that you'd have. You asked earlier, when I go to the studio, how I use this technique, you have to learn it so well that it's internalized and you can do everything you have to do in class that took 45 minutes in a minute. Okay. It just gets sped up over time. So when you go and do a role, do you actually consciously do stuff or is it more ingrained in you now that you can just go do your job or do you have to take pause for a minute and do stuff and prepare yourself if it's a really intense scene um yeah uh, if there's a huge emotion going on but it has to be fast yeah uh, especially in video games because we don't get the script in advance they just throw it in front of us that might be 70 pages wow there might be 400 500 lines wow i had a game uh roll the other day turn the page there was an unexpected character hugely emotional hugely real you something I've never seen in, in, in a video game script that I've been given mm. anyway. Oftentimes they want me to play the soldier or the villain or the um, alien. Mm. This is a down-to-earth person. And the content, I was very, very impressed that they would do this. This was uh, actually a scene with uh, two gay men in a medieval setting. Oh, wow. And they were just being normal, but they were falling in love. And it was beautifully, tastefully written. 
And uh, it really took me aback, which was great because it, it caused me to feel some real emotion for me. Like I was so blown away that I would see this in front of me. And I just put that right back into the character. And it worked really well. You uh, were truly in the moment. Yeah. You know, I had to do that one, one, one other time when I felt real emotion that had nothing to do with the script that was in front of me. The very last day of a show that I really cared about called Kaijudo, we did 52 episodes. Nobody watched this thing. The, the network, nobody even knew that it was there. It was called The Hub. It was around for four years, not very well advertised, not a lot of support for it. The company had kind of given up on it. But we, we threw our heart and soul into this show. And it was the last day, and I knew we were canceled, and I knew there was I, I would never have another chance to ever say the words of this character again, to never be ever be this character again. Mm. And it was the last page of the last script on the last day, and the character um, Scott Wolf was was my partner in this scene from Party of Five. Yeah, he played a little boy that uh, rode on the creature's back. And I was cast in this role, they said, because I didn't play it as a creature. I played the humanity of the creature. Mm. So I basically said something like, um, you know, now that the war is won, you won't need me anymore. And he said, you might hear my, my dog mm -hmm. lapping his water in the dog background. Having a drink. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and Scott's character said, are you kidding? We're going to duel together forever. And that was the end of the show, forever. But having a character have to say that, you know... It really represents the end of the show too, and the end of um, just the, the way we were we were treated on the show. It's like we put so much love into it, but nobody got to see it. And it's it's wonderful at conventions when people bring up that particular show. Um, it's greatly loved by those who actually saw it. So when they, oh, you were Bob, you were on Kaijudo. Maybe one person in every convention. It's usually a little kid, and I just give him free stuff and talk to him for a while and. It's um, it's fun for me. Was that an that was an animated show? An animated okay. series, yeah. Wow, and so uh, I'm very interested in the acting side of things. Um, so you go to, for example, the video video game, and you say this there's, there's like seventy pages of script that you're just given that you haven't been able to look at in advance, which I find pretty astounding. Why don't they send it to you in advance to let you rehearse it? Well, in a, in a typical video game now, there might be a hundred thousand lines of dialogue. Good uh, God. I've seen milk crates full of huge, thick binders, and that's going on in three studios at the same time. Good grief. They can't send you that. Right, There's I no guess way. not. And oftentimes the directors are cold too. You know, they'll jump in, they'll, they'll know the story because they've been working on the show for weeks, but he or she will look at the script and they'll be playing along with you. Wow. And there's usually a writer there that helps so that there's somebody there to guide you. So it's like what they call in uh, acting world cold reading, where you haven't seen the script before and they do classes on cold reading. So but, you just look at it and... But here's the extra thing. It's not an audition. It's the job. And you, you can't sound cold. Right. And sometimes I did a game yesterday where there were long speeches. It wasn't just one line. And I'd turn the page and there'd be this, you know, eight, ten line speech. And it's like, go. Wow. Well, sometimes I would say, I better read this first. Yeah. But sometimes, just for fun, I jump in and see, can I actually act this in a way that sounds world class? You know, these are games they expect yeah. really good acting. Completely out of my butt. You know, with, <laughs> I don't even know what I'm going to say. I don't even know what the word is three words from now that I'm going to wow. say. And that's a that's a skill you develop if you do a lot of video games. And are you running on instincts or have you got some little technique or trickery that you know what emotion you're going to dive into for well, these Well, you speeches? hope the first few words in the first sentence tells you where you're going. Right. And, and you can read just far enough ahead. You can read about a sentence ahead <gasps> and do all that emotional preparation you yeah. learn in class. In about two seconds. Good grief. It's actually a lot of fun. So in these, uh, in this sound booth, have you got like an internal almanac, a Rolodex of little emotional choices and preparations that you can just tap into as you're going through these pages of dialogue? It's very good that you brought that up because just like I'm not a voice actor, there are many very talented voice actors that have many characters up their sleeve that mm. they pull. I have no sleeves. I just stay in the moment and jump in. And the emotion has to hit me. You know, I have to know what it's supposed to be, hopefully. Mm. But I have to be able to come up with it on demand. Terrifying. Not for me. No. Well, it is for many people. Yeah. I, I, um, there's an actor that I work with now who has a completely different technique. And she will spend 
tons of time researching a part and, and mm. dealing with the physicality of the character, even though, even though it's an animated show. Mm -hmm. And I greatly admire that. That's fantastic. Yeah. But a technique that I've developed is to deliver a performance that seems like he, he just didn't know what, like the character doesn't, here's the ultimate, the character doesn't even know what's going to happen because he doesn't really. Um, no, of course, because none of us do. Have you read the script of what we're going to say in the next 20 minutes? No. <laughs> and neither has the character. Right. And I just found that I was able to do it. It was uh, it was a really lucky thing that I was able to do it. And that's actually propelled my career in the last few years. When I relaxed enough to let myself do that, you know, I wouldn't ask anyone, I wouldn't ask a student to even do that, you know, in their career ever. But for some reason, I got to the point in my life where I was able to do it. And it served me really well. Yeah. Shortly after I left, left the Neighborhood Playhouse, I did a summer of summer stock theater in Pennsylvania. Uh, Millbrook Playhouse. It's still there. It's in a barn. Uh, and I was doing the role of the telephone man in Barefoot in the Park. Neil Simon. Very funny. You read the lines and they're funny. Uh, you don't really have to do a lot of pushing with that. Well, he had to, my character had to run up the stairs and, well, actually make his way up the stairs, totally exhausted when he enters the scene, huffing and puffing. And there were a lot of other neighborhood playhouse people there that were into this huge um, basis of reality and everything we did. And I actually did sometimes run up and down the hill outside the theater to prepare for the scene. One night I just didn't feel like doing it. Mm. And this fellow who I had uh, gone to school with was there uh, in the company. He said, he literally, this is a kid thing. You wouldn't say this when you're older, but he said, you can't enter, you can't enter the scene. You aren't really tired. You aren't really exhausted. I said, watch me, I'll act. Right. I just walked on and I, you know, huffed and I puffed and it was fine. You pretended. Yeah. <laughs> like what the origins of all this is, people pretending to feel a certain way. I don't consider it lying. Some people say, you're a liar, you're acting, you're lying for a living. I'm trying to tell somebody else's truth. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. When you're doing the games, are you always by yourself or do you play opposite other characters? I've worked on... Officially, uh, according to my IMDb, around 60 games. And only twice have I ever, for only two sessions on two days in the entire last 20 years, have I ever worked with another person in a video huh. game. Wow. So here you're having to guess what the emotional situation is. And meanwhile, you've got some other actor in a booth who's doing dialogue opposite you and he's having to guess. So technically, could could they be editing it together and you've got one guy who thinks it's really a happy scene and then here's you who's furious? Well, that, that would hopefully not happen if they're really watching their P's and Q's, but there was one time when I, I did a role and they didn't show me a picture of it and they didn't tell me. I don't think the director knew. He was an old man. I didn't play him like an old man. Oh. And when I saw the game, I, I felt embarrassed because I would have made an adjustment. Yeah. It didn't make any sense. But that happens on occasion. Not as much anymore, but years ago it did. So is there the general rule that you do get to see all, a picture of all the characters? Mm, at least yours. <laughs> you, okay. Usually they show Just you something. Just your characters. Uh, and if you're lucky, they can show you some animation. They can, you can oh, see them okay. running around doing their thing. Okay. So you'll uh, show up, a normal session would be you show up, you're given the blob, the milk crate of dialogue. And they, at that point, would go, and here's a picture of the character. That's when you'd see yes. it. So in a split second, you've got to embody this alien mm -hmm. life form or whatever it is. Well, you, you will have an initial audition, but yeah. then that's a jumping off point. If they get to know you and they know you know your strengths and your weaknesses and what you're capable of doing, um, some of these games run for years because they're online now. Mm. So after a few years, you know they're just throwing stuff at you. Right. And you're recurring, you're doing things that you did a couple of years ago that have more lines, you know, that come back in the game. Right. But then they're throwing new stuff out. How do you remember the voice that you did for different characters? They play you a reference. Oh, And that's smart. another skill you have to have as a yeah. voice actor. Uh, if you do an audition with a character that you can't sustain, you're in a lot of trouble. And that happens right. to some people. That's happened to me once. At the very beginning of my career, I did um, a show called Action Man, and I was playing the lead. Okay. But he had a Northern European accent that oh. I could barely hold on to okay. <laughs> and when I got into the booth I couldn't really repeat it very well so mm. and they let me go it happens but that was at the beginning and something I had to learn yeah that's right you learned the lesson do you have sort of a repertoire of characters I mean do you can you say I do 67 different voices that kind of thing we talked about this earlier I don't pull anything out of my sleeve okay. they give me uh, uh, a visual and some basic idea of what they want and we possibly play around for a few minutes to see and it's all variations on deep obviously you know they won't be playing the uh, 12 year old girl parts anytime soon 
to me, the character changes because of the feeling in the room, you know, how he feels about life. Is he rich? Is he poor? Is he desperate? Is he relaxed? A character will have all those various emotions as they go through their lives, but there's usually a core of something that that character wants, needs, and is. And I try to find that. And I'll always try to find the humanity in a, a character that isn't human. I get asked about Gorilla Grodd that I play on The Flash. And the first thing out of most interviewers' mouths is, what's it like to play a gorilla? Aww. He doesn't know he's a gorilla. He's a being. Yeah. You call him a gorilla. There's a line in our first season where he's offered a banana. And to him, that's prejudice, in my mind. Uh, to him, that's stereotypical. Right. And you know, he's like, Grodd, hate, banana. Right. And he's, he's just evolving. His intelligence is, is uh, really just starting out. But you get the point. You know, he, his humanity is more important than the fact that he's physically a gorilla. But I think a lot of people would do the gorilla sounds and try to, you know, sound like a gorilla, but that's, that's not, never my thing, if that's what they're looking for. Do you remember auditioning me. for that character? Yes. I auditioned here in this apartment. Many things now that I audition for are done in a, a little closet booth that I have here. Yeah. Often late at night, because it's very quiet, right. there's no interruptions. And uh, yeah, just kept it simple. Kept so, it, uh, I would put a little sadness in there, a little bit of anger. There's a lot of anger in that character, but there's a, an isolation that makes him sad. And there's something in there that, that allowed me to add, I think, a nuance that got me the part. Wow. And do you remember, you know, your sort of prep work for doing that audition? Did you literally th picture? Now, do you picture things that this imaginary character has had happen or you take from your own life? If there's a, a huge big emotion. Um, it used to be that I would take it from my own life, but I learned it uh, over time to be able to feel that feeling and just put it into the words of the character. Mm. Mostly my preparation is just saying it over again, seeing where it goes, reading whatever they give me, try to do something a little bit off, a little bit different, because you usually get cast if you don't do what's expected. You know, if everybody's playing the same creature, do something a little bit different, their ears perk up. You know, so I don't do a ton of prep. In fact, I'm playing a lot of DC and Marvel characters now. I purposely don't go back and hear what people did 10 years ago, 15 okay. years ago, because it's a new production, a new way of looking at it. Unless they specifically say, they will sometimes give you references right. of things to listen to. Oftentimes what they mean by that is to give you a flavor of the way the character uh, looks at the world. Mm -hmm. It isn't often even to voice match it. Although I have done some voice matching. Um, I worked in uh, the movie Noah with Frank Langella's voice, okay. uh, matching that. Uh, it's not been publicized and, you know, I'm not looking for any glory from it, but it's something that actors will be asked to do sometimes, yeah. a technical thing, and it just helps the movie. Because, you know, there might be a couple lines that they need to add here and there, and they don't want to bring the star in for that. They, right. they have the voice actors do that. Does that irritate the star? I think some would uh, actually get approval on the voice okay. that helps them out. Because, I mean, basically you're acting on their behalf, aren't you? Well, you're trying to... Um, represent them in a sense it's almost like you're their voice agent in a sense because yeah. uh, you're uh, you're not being you you're not giving your interpretation of the role you're matching their interpretation yeah. of the role and have you had to do much of that with other celebrities matching their voice i don't specialize in that yeah. i was actually very surprised that i would be able to voice hmm. match frank langella but it, it worked out in that case do they do tweaking in the software to raise pitch and to make it match with that kind of stuff? Well, especially if it's a big character, not a voice match so much, but if it's a, a, a really big monster or something, there's always going to be some processing, some reverb, um, pitch changes. Oftentimes they hire me because I don't force the low voice. I just have the low voice mm. and they prefer that. So you deep voice. Were you a kid with a deep voice? Not at all. In fact, I was a desk cannon in the choir. I was wondering if my voice was ever going to change. It didn't drop till I was about um, 13 and a half, almost 14. And then it dropped right into the basement. My dad is the same kind of voice. Okay. And did kids make fun of it because it's a deep voice at that age? Well, if they made fun at all, they might try to imitate it like that, you know. <laughs> Were people saying to you, you know, you should think about a career in voiceover or did you think it? That is something that really kept me going. Uh, I, I was grabbed off a stage and just said, you should do villains. Uh, agent said, you should do villains in, in video. No, he said, you should do villains in animation. I said, okay. So I tried it. And it was where people were willing to pay me. So I just kept going with it. And then I really grew to enjoy it. So it's really like kind of accidental. Somebody saw you yeah. and said, you should do this. Yeah. I love that they said specifically you should play villains. Uh -huh. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> something about you <laughs> says villain. Do I seem very villainous yeah. to you? Well, you're a big guy. I mean, you're that type of guy that you would play a henchman in a movie. Like if it was a live action movie, I would cast you as like a the tough henchman on the bad side. <laughs> I have a story. I, I, I did a, a movie called Sparks. I've done some on camera and I, I'm pursuing it a lot more now. Oh, good. And um, in the scene that I was in, uh, I had to slap a little boy. Oh, dear. Now, I don't like slapping little boys or right. hurting any one and but we had to make sure 80 percent of that scene was me showing the audience that i was brutal but protecting the little boy and we had to do eight takes to make sure that we could accomplish that you know the, the most important thing to me was not actually hitting the oh, little boy gosh, yeah. um so i would stop takes if i thought i was going to hit him wow uh, it was a very late night scene outside lots of dust blowing in the wind and uh we did it we got a great take but I'll be honest, I'm a very sensitive guy. I don't, I'm not a violent person at all. I play a lot of violent characters, mm. but that's not who I am. And to have it in front of me live and not in a, in a studio somewhere as a voice uh, was very real for me. And I went off and I cried because I, I was so, I was, because I was holding back um, to actually show that brutality. You can't hold back, the camera will see. But if I actually hit him, it would have stayed with me for years i wouldn't have ever wanted to do that in fact i sat down with him beforehand it was his first thing he was six years old Aww. and and i said do you understand that you know i'm not angry with you but i'm going to be showing the audience that this character really really angry yeah uh and we're going to make sure that we don't hit you and i had to pro i made a promise and I'm really, really so happy that I didn't actually make contact with so him. So they just but, stood him in a way that you would sort of throw a punch, but it was blocked that you'd miss him by a couple of inches? Not at all. I had to run into the scene, hit my mark in the dark, in the dirt. Oh. And the dirt was moving around, so you couldn't see your mark. He had to hit his mark, too. At the same time, he was moving. And the director said, you have to hit him, you know, look like you're hitting him, so that the wind, can, he can feel the wind on his nose. And plus, I have an eyesight thing. I can't see very well. Uh oh. So we got it done. It all it all happened, but uh, uh, I was worried. And so it struck a nerve with you that you went off, and these emotions bubbled oh, up. Oh yeah. I mean, have, have you ever had to deal with that when you were a kid? Did you? Have no, any no, of that? no. I had no. I had no okay. physical abuse as a kid, but it was just that I wasn't anticipating hitting him. But I had. Here's the thing. It's an acting thing too. I had to really believe that that character was hitting him. Right. But if I stopped protecting him for a moment, I would have actually hit him. And the first thing they said at our Q&A, there were 2,000 people in an audience in San Jose. First question, did you really hit him? Right. And he was standing right beside me, and I took a chance. Because he could have just been a smart aleck, you know, and, and, and said that I did. But I put the, the mic down. I said, did I hit you? And he said, no, Mr. Sobolov. Ah. <laughs> Don't you, you've got to take, you know, a moment to acknowledge these parents, though. Seriously, these stage moms and dads, you know. Hey, can we use your six-year-old in a scene where there's a chance he'll get hit by this really big guy? He's not going to be able to see his mark because it's in the dirt and it's... It, and by the way, the guy has an eyesight issue. So he might not see your kid. I mean, these parents, yeah, come but you on. You know what? I don't want to go too far down that road because his dad was the director. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if that's better or worse. Well, I think his dad knew me and trusted <laughs> okay, me. Okay, okay. So it was all on me. To you make see sure he this didn't get stuff, hit. though. I mean, I watched a film the other day and there was a little baby in it, a real baby, and they put the baby on the floor and people are walking around the baby in the scene. Wow. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm not a mom, but the thought of putting your baby on the floor where people are walking around, I. I'd be like, no, you can't put the baby on the floor. I've done enough on camera that I've experienced a lot of this stuff um, with dangerous situations. Yeah. Also, uh, I had a scene. I was. It was a film about Sylvia Plath, and we were acting out one of her, her, her poems. And I had a baby in my arms, and we were in a, a warehouse. It was 90 degrees, 30 degrees centigrade for those of us in Europe listening. And we were dressed as if we were in winter. So the baby Whoa. had sweaters and hats oh, and things. Damn. So it had to be a situation where they flew in the baby and they started shooting. But no, there were some technical issues. He was oh. sitting in my arms and I saw him getting red. And the mom could see this. She looked distressed, but she was 
trying to, I don't know why she was playing along so much. You know, this is Hollywood. I'm not supposed to say anything. And I just stopped it. I just said, this kid's in distress. He's got to get oh, out of his clothes. Oh, yeah. Good grief. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it's a whole other thing, which is unexpected. I know we weren't going to talk about it, but there's a brilliant documentary. And as of now, you can watch it on YouTube. I don't know how long it'll be up, but it's called Star Suckers. And it indicates the power now of being a star and how kids are growing up just wanting to be famous. It's an actual thing that they want and they don't even have a comprehension. But what's even more scary is the parents and what they do in the documentary, not not to do a spoiler because this is early on in the movie, they basically set up in a shopping mall casting for children and they say horrible things like, we're going to have your kid drink alcohol and the parents are like, no problem, no problem. No, and we're going to have your... Your child's going to be handling some dead carcasses of some animals. Yeah, that's fine. He'll do that. No problem. And it's really an eye opener. I really recommend everybody check out this documentary, Star Suckers, because it even, it literally made me question myself, whoa, am I in this for the right reason? It goes really deep. I'm starting to do some on-camera directing. And as I move forward, I've thought about this, if I ever work with a child and the parents will have the interview, but I want to be in a situation where there'll be someone else there with us, but the parent steps out, and I ask the kid if he's really going to have fun yeah, doing this. Yeah, that's uh, smart. A good, good agent will do that too. Right. Where the mom or dad isn't around, make sure the kid isn't doing it for the wrong reasons, like to make money for the parents. Yeah. Yeah, I spent a lot of time living at Oakwood Apartments in LA, which is famous for child actors. And there was, you know, literally like Macaulay Culkin and Kirsten Dunst and the Olsen twins. All of these kids have lived there. I think that's what it's most famous for was, was child actors. So we would see a lot of these stage moms around. And some of it, I'll be honest with you, it's kind of sad because you've got these mums and dads who maybe haven't fared so well with their own careers. And they've got this kid that's really cute and he's kind of in, into it but the parents are really into it. And I've, I've sat in the pool and hot tubs and around, you know, coffee tables and heard the kids talking and the parents are like, well, you, you're going to do this, aren't you? And the kid's just like, yeah, well, I guess so, because daddy doesn't have a job. So, and, and all the responsibility of the household income is on a, an eight-year-old's shoulders. You know, it's pretty messed up. They're living their unfulfilled dreams, dreams through their children. Well, the child becomes, it's really dodgy territory, I think, because the child becomes this potential bank account, you know? I mean... Luckily, there's some laws that have been put into place, like the uh, Coogan laws, I think they call them, uh, to protect the kids, to make sure at least the money isn't stolen from them. Okay. And there are studio teachers that are on set, and I've been on set and seen these studio teachers, and if they're really good, it goes way beyond teaching them. They're there to make sure that they're not abused. Mm. Yeah, If yeah. they work them too many hours, like, oh, we got to stop. Did you ever want kids? No, I really didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but you have a rescue dog. I have a rescue dog because he's my kid. Yeah, he's awesome. He's like 10 foot away from us. Oh, he's beautiful. But you said he's a scaredy cat. He's a little scaredy cat, yeah. But, you know, I don't know what happened to him in the first year. So I, I have to give him a bit of a break. Uh, I had a trainer help me and she said there's only so much you can do. But we, we had a great relationship. He's good. Mm. He's a good boy. And so do you want to you want to go more now into on-camera acting? Are you actively sort of seeking this out? Yes, I, I have been lately. And uh, it seems that when I'm older, it makes more sense. The way I look and the way I sound makes more sense as an older man. Uh, and it, it seems to be, I've been getting a lot of film roles just thrown at me. Yeah. Uh, and I thought, well, maybe they're encouraging me by doing that. I should try this. I mean, you have a great look because it's a specific look. It's in the, I would say, the category of Michael Chiklis is who I think about. You're that big, tough guy. So it seems that's a very castable look. It's going to be interesting pursuing this at a professional level, just kind of without a ton of on-camera experience. Because I've had the training, uh, I think that I'll be fine, you know, in terms of the acting part of it. But will they accept a 50-year-old guy just jumping into the business? It could go one of two ways. They might go, wow, this guy can actually act, and we've never seen him before. He's not done 40 projects. Let's do it. Let's, let's use him. Or they'll go, where have you been for the last 30 years? Bye. So we'll see. There's no desperation. 
I've got my voice acting career. Yeah. That's continuing along great. And I'm doing the on camera for the right reasons because it's just something I would enjoy uh, pursuing. And I'm not worried about whether or not I'm going to eat if I don't get cast. Right. Well, you're clearly, I, I, you know, I've looked up your work and, and I know your reputation, which is you're a voice actor who really acts. You, you're very skilled. Thanks to Sanford Meisner and your neighborhood playhouse days, you, you learned your chops there. Did you have any other alumni in the class who went on to great things? Ileana Douglas was in my class. Okay. And Ileana and I had an interesting relationship at the time because she was a bit older. I was a kid and I was 19 going on 15. I was very immature at the time. And I'm sure that I really was really annoying to be around because I, I was a very emotional kid, probably very needy uh, in terms of just wanting to have friends around me and you know it's just not really uh ready for prime time so to speak <laughs> in terms of dealing with older people and i always felt bad that i was kind of kind of on her on her case a little bit too much when we were in class together and i always wanted to, to talk to her about it well i ran into her 20 years later wow it was awesome so and she said oh you were a kid it's okay well how were you on her case how I, does one be on someone's case in acting class well you know um just like a dog at your heels, you know, not as a dog, you know what I'm saying? Like a kid, you know, being too eager. Oh, oh you were kind of, okay, you were on a case in a in an after her kind of well, way. Not, not, like... not romantically, but trying to be friends or trying okay. to like spend time with her. Or I was just kind of a, oh, a, a well, little that's okay. buzzy pest, you You're know. You're just an eager guy. Yeah. Yeah, that's all right. I thought you meant on her case, like you're not doing your emotional no. choices correctly, you know. Hmm, okay. And uh, what about uh, in the voiceover world? I mean, in... Given, I guess, that the majority of work, you're by yourself, aren't you? Well, not in animation. Okay. Animation, you get the whole cast there. Okay, it's like a radio great. play. It's great. Okay. What are some of the cool folks that you've worked with in animation that stand out to you? Well, Tom Kenny, the voice of uh, SpongeBob SquarePants, okay. uh, has guested on things that I've been on. He's always a lot of fun. Um, Kevin Michael Richardson, who um, was um, on The Cleveland Show. Okay. Uh, he's fantastic. He's Groot on the Guardians of the Galaxy animated series that I'm working on now. Okay. Uh, Will Friedle, who's our Star-Lord. He was uh, Boy Meets World. Okay. Just, uh, and they're, they're just such great people. I've not run into a lot of situations where you're clashing with people's egos. We're really all there to help each other. I did Star Trek Into Darkness, the film, with Fred Tattashore. Ooh. And the two of us uh, did the Klingon voices. Any Klingon voice <laughs> you hear is us. And there was a lot of preparation for that particular role because it had to be the exact language. People know the language. Wow. The creator of the language language was there with us from the 80s. He was there, Mr. Wow. Cochran. And, uh, What's his sat, name, this guy? Uh, I'm going to really be in trouble here. Mark Okren, I believe. Okay. I always call him Ken. It's, it's, it's definitely Mark. We'll okay. look this up I'll later and we it. can delete it. Yeah, if it I'll double really check Mark. it. <laughs> yeah, um, no, I'm sure it is. And he, he was so kind to us. He pre-recorded all of the lines so we could hear what we were doing, okay. about 34 lines. Then he was sitting right there with us, not on the other side of the glass, right beside us, and like a cheerleader, so enthusiastic. <laughs> um, so we get the right energy of these characters. And I went in... David's, the, David's yeah. phone's going off. Oh, we're going to keep going here. Well, what it is, is it's this this new iPad doesn't seem to have any way there's to gadgets shut it off. Everywhere. Unless you shut it off, it has, it, there's no way to mute it. Can so I just say there's off. gadgets everywhere. There's <laughs> like a million remote controls running everything in the home. Okay, so back to the Klingon language. Okay. So, so he's all enthusiastic, like a nerdy cheerleader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it, the reason I brought up the story is about uh, lack of ego. Fred Tattashore plays the Hulk. He has got a huge career, but he's the nicest, most down-to-earth guy in the world. So we're in this together to help each other. I went first. We both did the same lines because they didn't know when they were going to use us. You know, it was going to be mix and match kind of thing. So we played all the characters in that scene, in the scene going on to the planet in, in the ship and on the planet, except the main Klingon that you saw on camera speaking. I did, I did my part first. We wrote all the notes down, and I handed him the notes because... That's what we do. We're what just, do you mean just, you're writing notes? What are well, your notes? Well, because Ken is there giving me absolutely specific oh, notes direction. about how to say okay. everything. And we help each other. Okay. And we all do. We all there, we're all there with a net to help each other. Can you do a bit of Klingon? Well, I won't be able to say the exact words, but it's sort of like, That's not correct Klingon. You know, there'll be people out there that know. I think you should do that on a date. <laughs> that wouldn't work out too well. 
<laughs> but I um uh, I care about the fans really getting a real experience out of uh-huh. this, and that's real for that for them. They that's a language that is yeah. well documented. And if it was Ikakok, but it was supposed to be Ikakek, nope, do it again. It had to be perfect. Wow. And that's cool. I'm dedicated to doing as good of a job as I can. And did you just learn the lines in Klingon or did you kind of get a SWAT book where you get to learn like a travel guide of key phrases? <laughs> no, it was all like uh, Charo coming to America. Uh, when Charo came to America, she was just speaking by rote. Now they told us what each line meant, but we didn't know what we were saying really right. unless they told okay. us we wouldn't have known. Okay. We didn't really have to learn the language. It was just repeating. But you but they would tell you what you was what the yeah. line meant as yeah, you, have you to knew do that. how angry you were going to be. When I did Halo 4 the video game, it was a very similar situation. A very interesting story because that game they did a variation of Japanese. And for the first couple of sessions, we did exactly as written, but it was such a challenging language that it was taking 10 minutes per line. And you know, I said earlier that there might be 400 lines in a session. They couldn't get through enough material. So after a couple of sessions, we said, "Let's improvise." We're just going to make it kind of sound like that with the occasional word thrown in that's key. Well, the lawyers got a hold of that after a couple of sessions that said, we don't know what you're saying. Go back to the script. So got a few extra sessions out huh. of that one. Oh, oh, excellent. So when you were doing the Star Trek uh, film, did you get to actually work with J.J. Abrams? I was in his building, but he was not physically there. Okay. So who was sort of directing It was really your... Mark Okren that was okay. running the show. Uh, we had um, a post-production supervisor there. But Mark was the creative force behind that. Did you say he's the one who invented, he invented this Klingon the language. language? Well, the language was invented, I believe, in Star Trek II. They had had Klingon characters back to the 60s, but they yeah. always spoke English. Oh, got well, it. the day came along on the set that somebody was supposed to speak this other language, and they hadn't thought about it. They didn't know what he was wow. going to say. And the fellow that played Scotty? Yes. Mr. Doonan, he saw what was happening. He just wrote something down. He said, here, you say this. And they had to take that as the genesis of the language. Oh, that's hilarious. And, and he's a real linguist, this fellow. And he, he took that and, and turned it into something. So they brought him in to work with yes. this little line of gibberish that Scotty wrote. Because it was canon now. It was oh, in the movie. this is hilarious. I wonder if that's common knowledge, that it was based off Scotty's little ad-lib gibberish well, that's line. That's what he told me. Oh, wait till I tell my dad. My dad's <laughs> a big Star Trek guy, my brother. <laughs> well, and so, so I mean, what was he like, this Klingon language guy? I mean, is he like, is he quiet and nerdy or is he all He was chill enthusiastic and, and nerdy. Okay, enthusiastic very and nerdy. Very pleasant, very happy that we were there and um, couldn't have been more pleasant. And does this guy have a whole other job? I believe he's a university professor, okay. but I could be wrong. So this is like the world's coolest sideline that he has. He's mm-hmm. a university professor who invented the Klingon yes. language. Wow. <laughs> I have a feeling, uh, I'm just taking a guess, most of his time is probably taken up with Klingon stuff because it's such a huge thing. Okay. How come J.J. wasn't there? I'm disappointed. I'm a huge J.J. fan. Well, quite often, voice is thought of as a post-production element, no matter how important it is in in an actual on-camera production, usually dealt with by post-production supervisors or, in in the case of The Flash, the post-production co-producer was the one directing me. So you very rarely will get the actual director of the film. Um, I worked on Serenity, uh, the film that was based on the television series Firefly. Okay. And there, Fred Tattashore was there that night as well. And uh, no, no, no director. Now, I'm sure you've got an opinion, but you're probably a really politically correct we'll guy in the industry. <laughs> How does it make you feel that the director wouldn't be there directing voice actors? They've got so much to take care of. You know, if they're shooting the film at the same time, they can't be there. It's like a second unit. You know, where they have to they have to have another director because they're shooting right. two things at once. So I get it. Right. I don't feel insecure about that. Okay. Did you get to go to a rap party, a Star Trek rap party? No. <gasps> Do voice guys get invited to that? No, not often. Sometimes even if you're, I, I don't want to get into specifics too much, but I've heard a lot of stories, these big animated movies sometimes. Unless you're a celebrity, sometimes you don't get invited. Oh, even if you're a main voice in sometimes, the show. Sometimes, most of the time they take wow. care of it, but sometimes not. So it's interesting. I was going to ask you about this and maybe I'm wrong. I mean, I know voice people and they know who the big hot shots of the voice industry are, which I think you're one of them. But why isn't there more of a star system, do you think, for voiceover actors? Maybe I'm wrong, but why isn't the SpongeBob SquarePants guy a household name? Well, he is. Tom Kenny really, if if anyone is, he is. Okay. 
they don't see our faces. So in a sense, if you can mimic the voice, they could bring somebody else in if they want to. Okay. You know, I'm a guest in their house. I don't try to take over the house. It's cool. When we do an animated series, usually if there's 52 episodes, there's 52 contracts hmm. every single day. It's a day player kind of thing. It's a volume business, really. So you never feel secure then? Does anyone? Well, I think main actors in series would feel somewhat secure. I don't think they'd get a contract for every single episode. Well, for the most part, you know, they're not, they're not, they're not going to move on from you unless something really drastic happens. There was only one time in my career when I wondered about that. I played RoboCop years ago in a, a 1990 series, and they had no intention of casting me. I was a scratch voice. They wanted a celebrity, but they couldn't find a celebrity to do it for the money that they're paying, they were paying me or anything close. So every day we would go in, I think the first six episodes, and we were in Vancouver. You could hear them in L.A. in my headphones playing what I was doing for people. It's like, can you sound like this? Oh, do you want to do that's this? that's creepy. Well, but I, I never thought I was, I was being uh, cast in the part. Wow. So, but then at, at about episode seven, they said, okay, you've got the part. Wow. So, but why wouldn't they have just given you the part? Why are they giving it to other people going, can you sound like this guy who we really like? Well, they wanted a celebrity. Oh, okay. Because a celebrity in a sense, I mean, let's Got be it. honest here. They don't know my face. So, you know, Jimmy Kimmel may not want me sitting there, but they, they would want somebody that's a known quantity. It's so funny that they want the celebrity to sound like the guy who's not famous. Well, I was kind of the, well, that's why it's called a scratch track. You're scratching it in as an example of, of what it might sound like when it's done for real. Have you gotten a lot of work from being the scratch track guy? Noah was supposed to be scratch, and it turned out that they used some of what we did in the film. Okay. Uh, oftentimes, uh, for the, the sound-alike stuff, uh, as in Noah, I think it was meant for test footage and, and just, um, just trying things out, you know, and they, they didn't want to bring Frank Langella in for that. Mm -hmm. But then they ended up integrating it in. And I know, is it true I've heard a rumor that there's some strike pending possibly in the video game voice industry is that true well at the moment there is definitely an ongoing negotiation i'm not involved in that at all um i'm not part of the negotiating team at all um but there's definitely something brewing where uh, the talks have broken down and and they're gonna have to see where it goes next and i'm gonna hazard a guess that actors are saying that they want residuals is that what it might be about yeah um but what they're asking for is really really minor um and I don't want to get into it too much, but I'll just tell you this. In the last couple of months, I have never done this many video game sessions in my life. They're definitely They're panicking. bringing us in a lot. Yeah. They're panicking that suddenly no, no voice actor worth his salt's going to be available. We'll see. I don't, I don't know. Strike. I can't say what's in their mind, but yeah. I've been working a lot. I guess it does make sense, though, that the actors, I mean, I'm, I'm on the side of the actor there that they should get residuals. Don't video games now make colossal times more money than the actual movies they make more than movies yeah yes. like drastically more mm -hmm. not just a little bit like but you know in hollywood it's all about leverage you know do you have uh something that they want enough to give you what you want so that's kind of the game that's being played right now mm. i think hmm interesting and you mentioned about even though you're a big kind of hulky guy that you're sensitive would you say have is this you've always felt sensitive from a kid? And how do you tell that where you are on the spectrum of sensitivity that you think that you're more sensitive than the average person? Well, let's use a horoscope okay. uh, example. I'm stereotypically what I am. As, I don't totally believe in this stuff, but I, uh, I'm a Libra. Okay. But I'm not. I'm right into Scorpio, actually. I'm 10 minutes into Scorpio, but it's so close to Libra that I've got balance but passion. Okay. You know, and... Um, that actually is really who I am. I, I love fully and completely or not at all. Mm -hmm. It just seems to be who I, with my friends Sounds and people good. I'm closer to. And um, I'm not so sensitive that I'm having to go and, uh, and have a lot of therapy or uh, uh, be institutionalized or anything. Mm. But it does help me in my work. And ah, it helps me in ahead. life too. You know, I, I think I'm a pretty honest person and a pretty open person. And... Uh, I don't really believe in the, the facade thing. You know, I'm, I'm playing characters all week long. And when I'm not playing a character, I don't want to play another character to try to hide who I really am. Mm. Have you always felt and considered yourself sensitive? Oh, yeah. I've been that way ever since I was a kid. And how did that manifest? I mean, how did you start to think, oh, other guys don't seem to be I reacting this way? I have my feelings hurt a lot, but I'm not like that anymore. I've got a tougher skin than I used to, but yeah, I feel things deeply, you know? Um, that's really all I can say about it. 
nothing much to analyze. It's just I'm trying to be awake and aware and in life and in my work. Well, I guess it is a very good place to be for an actor. I mean, you want to have access to all those impulses and raw emotions. Don't well, you? that goes back to the Ileana Douglas story because I think you know I couldn't quite identify. It's been years since I even thought about it, but I think it was just a very emotional person at the time, and it was kind of annoying for people. <laughs> and I think it, after a while, um, it wasn't drama anymore. It was just in real, real, real time. You know, so if it was really made sense to feel something, I would feel it. I wouldn't just force it like a kid would. Mm. But it was great. It was great for the actor. I remember when there was one acting teacher early on that saw that and it was always like too much emotion. He just said, never lose that. Mm. You can use that later on. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You don't want to build the wall over the emotions. I mean, so many people are much more sensitive than we ever give them credit for. I swear half the grumpy people in the world who are mowing around being grumpy, it's because really they're sensitive and just nobody's acknowledged it. My dad seemed to be a very stoic fellow, but when he died... He wasn't showing a lot of emotion at all. I was kind of like the complete opposite of him. When he died, I went into his drawer, and you know, it was from a different generation. So he had, you know, cufflinks and accoutrement that you would have, you know, on a suit. And there was all the all the things that would um, normally be out in a room if if it was in a more emotional relationship. My first demo tape was there. My headshot was there. A note that I had sent him was there, but hidden in a drawer. Hmm. So that's really very much like what you were just speaking of. He he was sensitive, but he didn't want to show anybody. Right. Yeah, I, I pretty much, I, I'll bet my money on that, that grumpy people are sensitive and just nobody's ever acknowledged them and recognized their emotions, I so think, they're grumpy. I, I think the way it's sort of progressed with me as I've gotten older uh, emotionally is that I'm not afraid to be real. Um, and I think a lot of people are. You know, if, if I'm sad about something, I'll cry. That's mm-hmm. okay. Mm-hmm. I don't have to hide that. That's human. I like being a human. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's your job to be well, human that, under that a magnifying glass. That part isn't my job. Glass. But my, my, I think my job in life is to not be, uh, not be running around trying to hide from what's really inside. Just, I think if everybody was like that, it would be a much better world. Have you ever had any kind of therapy or anything? I did once. Um, just for a year, I had a situation many, many years ago where I started having anxiety attacks. Okay. And I thought, okay, I maybe need to go to someone about this. But what was actually happening was I was producing a tour at age 23 mm. to Canada. I was working full time in an office and I was acting in a play at night. Okay. Now, physically, that was too much to ask. Yeah, I had a breakdown from and that. Mentally. I think. Yeah, I had a little mental breakdown from that. But when I realized how to treat myself better and that I wasn't invincible, it got better. And there's different types of mental breakdowns. There's the crying ones, the can't breathe ones, the angry outburst ones. What what kind did you have? It was the um, can't breathe. Oh, the can't breathe. And I've had that too. Can't breathe and can't do anything. When it hit me, I went to a friend's place. He was a, a soap opera writer. He was writing a soap opera and I just laid on the couch because I couldn't make it home. Mm. Yeah, but I'm really glad that I figured out why that was happening and then it was able to dissipate. I, don't ha- I haven't had that for over 10 years now. It is staggering how much our mental situation affects our physical being. I mean, I've had that breathing happen. I, I used to have it a lot. I wouldn't be able to close and lock the restroom door on an airplane because I was claustrophobic. And I couldn't slide the thing across. It, the, if even I went to slide it across, it would feel like my heart was going to come out of my mouth. And this went on for years. And there were some very embarrassing situations, usually with some elderly man who'd open the door. I'd be like, sorry, <laughs> someone in here. As a child, I was agoraphobic. Okay. Uh, I was afraid of open spaces. So I would always walk by the wall. That was a thing that I grew out of at puberty. It was weird. That's an interesting one. As soon as I turned 12, 13, that went away. Did anybody ever give you an explanation of where that comes from, agoraphobia? That's an interesting one. I never talked about it with anyone. Open Probably the spaces. first time I've ever mentioned it to anyone is right here. Yeah. I mean, it's unbelievable. I'm learning as I'm doing these sorts of shows how everybody's got, everybody's got stuff. We're all human whether we admit it or not. A lot of people will not admit it. Mm. Most of the people that you talk to do. Yeah. Um, I don't even think that it's it's that you bring it out in them. It's that you you seek out people that are willing to talk. Uh, you don't want someone that's just going to go by a script that a, a company gave them. That would be a boring interview. It just fascinates me. And so when you had the breathing anxiety, 
Do you remember anything that your therapist told you of how to deal with that? Because I think that's really useful stuff for people to know. I had a very kind therapist, but not a very good therapist. Okay. There's a special technique that she had. I had never been to therapy. I didn't know any better. Reflecting back everything that I was doing. So if I was oh. sad, she was sad. If I was happy, she was oh. happy. And I thought, what am I? What? She's <laughs> it's not, like Meisner. We've come full circle. It was. Circle. It was totally Meisner. <laughs> and after a while, um, you know, the only time I cried in that session was when I gave her the check. I was going to say when she gave you the bill. Yeah. Because it felt like, why am I paying something I could work out with a friend? It felt. And yeah. I think if she had been a... a probably a, used a different, I won't say a better therapist, but had a different technique, it probably would have been a more effective um, therapy for me. But as it was, it wasn't doing anything. I was working out my own issues. She was bringing stuff up from when I was a kid that I had already worked out. Okay, right. I, really, I seriously had already worked it out. Yeah, we don't have to talk about my mother <laughs> again. True. Well, but you, I think a lot of times in life people get caught up because they're looking for problems that don't exist. You know, don't... There's enough problems in life. You don't have to add anything artificial on top of it all. Mm. Or other people will try to impose that on you. It's like, well, your problem is this. And sometimes you can't even talk your way out of it because they don't believe you. I think if people spend too much time in their own head, it's not a healthy thing. And know? boy, do I not get a chance to spend much time in my own head because I'm playing so many different people's lives. You're in other people's I'm heads. I'm in other people's heads. <laughs> <laughs> They've now got the panic attacks. Yeah, they can have a panic attack. <laughs> and how would you say that you got over that? I mean, did you just have to whittle your life down a lot? Well, I had, it was always, uh, the first first time I was having it was when I was lived, lived in New York City and I was doing all that stuff and I was just doing too much. Wasn't eating, wasn't sleeping, was doing way too much when I sort of realized that I was human that I could only live one life and not 14 lives, then I was much better. Mm. Had a little bit of anxiety when I first moved to LA as well. Uh, the loneliest time in my life was the first six months I spent here. Mm. You know, and, and I'm in the same apartment, and I wanted to talk to you about that. Sure. I'm in the same apartment for the same reason that Marla Gibbs worked at Burbank Airport for the first two years of the Jeffersons. Okay. So the last four or five years, my career has really taken off. And I'm still paying debts back from when I was struggling. Wow. And I spent years eating peanut butter sandwiches and I didn't give up. And I mean, that's the biggest thing. I don't think I'm necessarily the most talented person in the world, but I never gave up. Right. I kept at it. I kept yeah. at it. I kept at it. And I learned as I went along. Um, but there's a lot of sacrifice. And you talked about kids that want to be instantly rich or instantly yeah. famous. That might happen. But if you make that your goal... 99.999% of yeah, people are going to fail. But exactly. They, we have this, uh, this lottery mentality in this country, you know, and, and that's something that really damages people. Like they, they think they deserve to be rich or they think they, they, um, they go for that as a goal. Money is a goal or fame is a goal. And how about doing the work? How about enjoying the characters that you play? How about in, um, reveling in the wonderful people that you meet along the way? And whatever happens, happens beyond that. What is life? Life is not trying to force something to happen. Life is living. Oh, here's the plumber. Plumber right just there. got here. Hello, I am the plumber. I believe you have a plumbing incident. Is it a leak? If it is a leak, I will lick it. I will lick this leak into shape so that it is no more. Well, I could acknowledge what's happening because this yeah, yeah. definitely, you know. So, it's, yeah, we, we've got the plumbing happening right now. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> a real thing, too. That's life. Yeah, exactly. Uh, a 1955 building I'm in, the, the pipe rusted through, so it's why time for did, a replacement. Why did you leave Canada? Because of voice acting. Uh, I had a, a manager at the time, and he kind of forced it on me. He came down here, he set up four meetings with four different agents, and he said, David, get on a plane. I had shows on the air in the States, like three different shows. I had Beast Wars. Uh, I had Sabrina, the animated series, and, or, and Robocop, those three shows. So he, he said, well, he was a friend. Like, why don't you go for it? So I came down, and all of the agents wanted to sign me. So I thought, okay, I'll give it a shot. Plus, I'm a U.S. citizen through my parents, so there wasn't any immigration issue. So I just came down. You're going to hear a little banging because yeah, there's yeah, a little, little plumbing right. going on. We got pipes being fixed. <laughs> Shit got real. <laughs> <laughs> um, you were saying, though, about you had a hard time uh, when you first came to L.A. Did you know people down here? Uh, no, I knew no one. And I was here for six months. And uh, the first six months was very lonely. You know, I didn't uh, know people, but I got to know people. I had all sorts of work booked when I first came here. I did a, a show with Rob Paulson. 
And it was with Warner Brothers' very early internet portal called Entertainedom. Mm. It was kind of too early. They were trying to be ahead of their time. People didn't have broadband internet in the year 2000 to download this stuff. But it was a show that was supposed to end up on the on the WB, uh, and it was planned to have tie-ins with Burger King. It was going to be a great deal to sort of um, be the first thing to launch off my career in, in L.A. But the AOL Time Warner merger happened. The guys that ran the show lost their stock options, and they pulled the show. And I went to work in a chiropractic clinic for a year. Oh, so well, I that's could live. interesting. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and you'll see a gap in my resume, and that's the year that I worked there. You have to somehow be able to uh, commit yourself to this fully or it doesn't work. You have to be available for opportunities. You have to be training, but you have to have enough money to live. So that's yeah. the reality. But if you take that nine to five job, things will drop away for you in this business. So when you say that you're still paying off debts, I mean, did you spend your money on anything extravagant or was this just hard living costs of you I, know, I had people that helped me survive for a while. And uh, now it's so much better. And it's going to be great, you know, if things keep going the way they're going. And there's no guarantee that they will. And I'm not afraid to tell people that. It's like, you know, I had a rough few years. Yeah. And uh, luckily I made it through. I collected, in a sense, people that believed in me over time. I, I, and, I, and I did it by trying to do good work, showing up and, and having a work, work ethic. You know, that I, I wanted to do good work. And I... I didn't try to prove myself to anybody. I just showed up and, and did it. And after a while, enough people knew that. Mm. And if you know 150 people that have seen your work and would love to work with you, eventually there'll be constant work because mm -hmm. one or two of them will have a job at any, any given moment. It's a pretty tight industry, the voiceover industry, though, isn't it? Like it I, seems to be exceptionally hard to get into for I people. I would say with animation, I'm guessing animation video games, there's maybe 120 of us that work all the time. Wow. And you see the same people at, at almost every session. So getting into that club took a while. So out of 160,000 members of the Screen Actors Guild, 120 are actively working VO people. Yeah, well... Animation and video game view of people. Of yeah. course, there's tons of people that do commercials and other things. Right, right. Uh, I believe the statistic is that 3% of the Screen Actors Guild makes their living at acting. Oh, wow. That's sad, isn't it? It's, I don't want to say that it's sad. It's just the reality of yeah. it. Yeah. And you have to be prepared to sacrifice and do the work that needs to be done, like in any other profession. And the people that go for the fame, 50 of them in 10 years, it works out for do you socialize with other VO people? Yeah, uh, we're always running into each other at events. I uh, I like to support charity, and on Wednesday nights quite often I, I work with a group called Combat Radio, mm -hmm. and they're raising money for homeless children in the Valley. Uh, it's nice to be at the point now where um, I can give something back. I can yeah. spend some time doing that. That's awesome. I went to one of those because of your kind invitation, and it was fantastic. It's um, a party. And the, and he, uh, the fellow, Ethan Dettenmeyer, was a former executive at Warner Brothers, and he knows tons of showrunners, and he can put together these amazing evenings. There was a third Rock from the Sun night. Is that the night you came? No, it, it wasn't. There was another. It was the Batman night uh, with the Batman uh, c character voices, which I found fascinating because Batman was Hispanic. Yeah. <laughs> and I loved that. Because his voice is Batman, and then you would never picture the face because you always think of like a Bruce Wayne looking guy. I, I think it's time for a lot more diversity and to not be so stuck in what the comic books were 40, 50, 60 years ago. The world has changed. It's yeah. time to change with it. I say that, and yet I just produced a couple of films where I realized that everyone in the film is white, and I, I will not be doing <gasps> that again because this world is not obviously all one thing. No. It's many different things. Yeah. They've got a mandate in the UK where they've told all the production companies in the UK that they have to have 20% of not only their cast, but all of their below the line people as well. All of the writer, crew, directors have got to have, they've got a range of quotas. There's ethnicity, there's disability, and there's sexual orientation. And uh, they basically, some of the networks have said, we will not commission your show if you haven't got 20% of the cast represented by these categories and 20% of your crew. And, you know, so, yeah, things will be changing. I'm sure the same thing's going to happen over here, too. It's interesting, interesting being a gay guy who's playing these deep voice heroes and villains and stuff, because I, I don't know if I'm uh, portraying anything that people may consider to be 
stereotypical in one way, either in the straight world or the gay world. But um, I wasn't going to bring it up. I don't mind bringing it up because <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't necessarily spend a lot of time talking about it because it's just part of who I am. But occasionally it'll, it'll come up at work because mm-hmm. you know, after a while, like, like this cast that I'm in, they start talking about their lives. You're doing 52 yeah. episodes with people and it's a little family. And I don't want to be excluded from that. I want to be able to talk about it. And it's wonderful that the world is progressing. And it kind of circles back to my story from earlier doing the video game scenes with the gay guys. Uh, And I thought it was a beautiful thing that they're completely relaxed about it. They're not going to do a huge press thing about it. It's just going to be in the game. And that's what I want to see the world progress to where everyone just lives their lives and it's accepted. I mean, that's a a pipe dream, but I would love to see it. Oh, I think we're going to get there. But sadly, it may not be in our lifetimes. But we've seen some progress. Yeah. It was interesting, the game, the fact that it was medieval guys as well. Yeah, That's which unusual. was even wonderful. You know, it's uh, in, a, in a time when it, things would have been 100% closeted. Yeah. Did you direct Mariette Hartley in a project? Yes. Uh, there was a film that we did a couple of years ago called The Dentros, and we're finally finishing it, and it's going to be out. Um, John Saxon played her husband. Was Mariette Hartley, and I'm going back to when I was a little, little girl, did she play the Incredible Hulk's wife in the original series with Bill Bixby? I'd have to look it up, but that sounds familiar. Yeah, that might have been. Have you had any embarrassing meetings when you've met celebrities and maybe you were starstruck or just any things that, oh, I shouldn't have done that or said that? I don't have the greatest memory in the world, so I, I like to... Uh, you never you never know if you're going to meet someone on the street or wherever you're going to meet them. I, I've been doing a lot of work with the combat radio, as I mentioned, and they may throw a celebrity in front of me, and I don't know anything about them, and I have to mm. kind of vamp. I don't even know who they are sometimes, <laughs> even if they're famous. They don't give you a heads up? Oh, it's just, it's a wonderful fly-by-the-seat-of-the-pants deal. It's uh, three million people hear this show. He um, he brings people into the fold that are not only interested in, in raising money for the charity, but can kind of wing it. Like we're kind of doing. Right. Really. Right. Between the two of us, we haven't had too many freezy moments during this conversation. But then I knew that it was going to be you, and so I looked up stuff about you and learned a bit about That's you. That's true. But I, I think some people who are maybe a little bit less comfortable on a mic, um, they might not be able to keep talking. That happens. You have to be able to keep talking. So when you... I just think it's, uh, I'm imagining these people that you're working with and then casually you drop out with your deep voice, casually in a conversation that you're gay. Have you had people be really surprised and be like, whoa, did not have that pegged, <laughs> you know? Because I mean... Yeah, that, that's happened recently, actually. Um, and <laughs> not in a negative way. It was like, really, really, really? <laughs> but I mean, what, what, is, what is the um, personality or the, um, the way of being gay? I guess it's, would have their own way. Well, you know? it's a stereotype, isn't it? You you just sort of assume there's going to be a excessive femininity about somebody, but clearly not. You know, it's different things for different people. Yeah, yeah. There's a movie. I wish I could remember the movie. Um, I have this, this character in the '80s sitting on a staircase and talking about being gay and how he figured out that he was gay. He just literally looked down at his genitals and said, "What do you like?" Oh, you like that? Okay, we're fine. I just went on from there. <laughs> hey, how's it going? Oh, we're doing the a radio show. Here. Come on in. <laughs> this is, this is our, our plumber. Hello? I have finished. The leak is no more. It is gone, threatened of my powers, and I assure you there will be no more leaking in this apartment. Or oh, apartment. Au revoir. <laughs> Okay, we're good. That's what you just said before the plumber. Yeah, and uh, it would be nice if the world got to the point where we just accepted people for who they were, and it causes a huge amount of turmoil for most people Mm. if they're different. Yeah. And it did for me too, but I'm at a point now where it's like, it's just part of who I am. But at the same time, I don't want to introduce myself as being gay. It's like, oh, it's the gay guy. No, it's David. And he does good work, and he's a nice guy. Oh, he happens to be gay. Right, right. Did you used to not be open about it? Oh, yeah. Early on, definitely. When we were doing RoboCop, it was actually a very uh, traumatic moment for me because they decided that they would play this gay hookup phone line in our headphones while we were getting ready to record. Oh. And they were all laughing at all the people that were trying to find companionship. Oh. And at the time, I didn't feel comfortable saying anything, but I felt really horrible. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. In the second year of Big Brother, I was asked to be on the show. And I went down, did an interview. They had already cast me. Something was up. They were setting something up. I don't know what they were setting up. Uh, I, I didn't do it for two reasons. They gave me a contract. And the way it worked back then, they give you $750 a week stipend. Um, but you couldn't collect any of it till the end of the show. So unless you were destitute or rich, there was, if you were in between trying to you know, pay bills or maintain an apartment, there was no way to do it. Uh, and also, a friend that worked in reality TV called me, and he said, uh, what they'll do to you in editing isn't worth the $500,000. Wow. So yeah, the, the, there's a show called Unreal that I like now that is uh, showing behind the scenes at the reality shows uh, from a Ooh, producer's perspective. That sounds fun. A producer of reality show. Uh, What's that called? Unreal. Unreal. Yeah, she produced it. It's very interesting, I find, though, about the sexuality side of things because I'm very sympathetic to the feeling of not being able to truly be yourself, especially in the workplace. So now the world has changed in your lifetime enough that you can be open. Do you ever feel negativity when people find out? I mean, I think uh, in certainly LA, not in the arts. People no. are very open, um, but you know, there's still prejudice out in the world. Mm. But you know, water off a duck's back. This is That's where it helps deal. to be a big threatening I guy. Guess, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I were, you know, I'm single right now, but if I were with somebody and we were in a little town somewhere where I know it's really frowned upon, yeah. I probably would be. You know, careful not to hold the guy's hand out in public. Right, and you that know, sucks. I, I, it sucks, but I'm you know, I'm not really an in-your-face kind of guy, so I'll just do what I have to do to not you know be shot. Right. Any advice you would say to people coming to Hollywood? Come with dreams. Come with work ethic. Don't come with stars in your eyes because it's not going to work out well. I've seen people, even in this building, that come here with this, I have to be famous, I have to um, be rich thing, and it quickly falls apart for them. They either stay and end up in, in drug addiction, uh, substance abuse, uh, prostitution. I've seen this, you know, people that absolutely down-to-earth people, and it destroys their lives, this pursuit of this unrealistic dream. If you just prepare to do the work and put your time in, and it's okay if it takes 10 years. That's pretty much what it took for me. I was working, but to really have a solid career, it took a lot of years before the, in this big pond there were enough people who knew my work. Mm. Yeah, that sounds very keep good it real. advice. Yeah. Keep it real. I wanted to ask you just about your character Drax from the Marvel Guardians of the Galaxy. They found a certain demographic of kids responding to that character. Drax does not understand you if you don't speak literally. And... I have to research this more, but my understanding is that it may be the way uh, a mind of an autistic child works. Okay. Uh, and for some autistic children, I've heard that Dave Bautista and the Drax character have become somewhat of a hero. Oh. And I am more than ready. If I go out into the world and, and I encounter a child that feels that Drax is someone they can look up to, I'm going to respect that and honor that and do what I can to yeah. make them feel happy. That's fantastic. I mean, that's a, such a common issue now. It's, it's big stuff, mm -hmm. you know, the Asperger's and autism. There was a fellow, a young fellow who came up to me at a convention in Texas, and I have a, a cloth that I put over my, my booth with uh, some of my most popular characters. I change it once a year. Uh, a friend of ours, Jason Canning, designs all of my stuff. Mm -hmm. and people love it. Our dear friend, Our dear Jason friend, he's a wonderful Canning. guy. Um, and this child... All he said to me, he walked up to my booth and he pointed at 20 of those characters and named every single one of them. That's the only thing he said to me. Oh, but he said a lot, didn't he? Yeah. He related to all of these characters. Well, I've got to throw it out for anybody who might have an autistic child. In England, I was doing a lot of research on sound healing. They're using tuning forks and sound healing very successfully with autistic kids. Like, awesome. So have a Google of that. Fantastic. David Sobotloff, it's been fantastic being amongst your packaging. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for uh, Why does that sound terribly obscene? <laughs> I feel like now I'm... You feel being, well packaged? I feel like I've just sexually harassed you. Your packaging is fantastic. <laughs> what a great package. Look at that package. <laughs> Yeah, looking good considering it's so old. <laughs> oh, that's bad. That's bad. This has been delightful. It's great to to hang out with you and your beautiful rescue dog. 
And uh, what's the f- next thing we can see you on that we've got to go out and listen to you? Well, definitely Guardians of the Galaxy. Guardians on of the September Galaxy. September 26th Brilliant. on Disney XD. Cool. Our Marvel show will debut. Excellent. Right now you can go to iTunes and download the origin story of each of our characters. Oh, that's phenomenal. Yeah. And it was the number one downloaded television of any any te- any TV program a couple weeks ago when it first wow, debuted. Wow, wow. So I think there's some pent-up desire for more Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, that's fantastic. What's that iTunes uh, show called for people to download? Guardians of the Galaxy Origins. Brilliant. Easy to remember. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. David Sobolov. So right after I turned off the mic, David politely and graciously corrected me on the pronunciation of his name, Sobolov. So polite. He didn't want to correct me while we were recording. So not sob, like crying. Sob. Like if you said it's so bright, but were interrupted. Sobolov. So be sure to look out and listen for David in Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, coming out on Disney XD on September 26, 2015. Visit thegrayescape.com for images of the vintage packaging, photos of me and David, and more. I am going to get a voiceover agent because I think I got what it takes. Catch you next time on The Grey Escape. Hello, it is me, the plumber. I have returned to inspect the pip to see that no leaking is happening here. And I need to be paid for leaking this pesky little leak. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, David Soboloff. Did I say it right? <laughs> I have returned to... Uh... <laughs> 